welcome to Two Boomer Women. I'm your host, Agnes Knowles. I've been talking with Boomer Women for almost a decade now. (laughs) Well, I guess I've been talking to Boomer Women all my adult life. Uh, Reinventing myself several times along the way, though, but always focused on us, Boomer Women. With this incarnation of Two Boomer Women, I'll be interviewing other women who have a message of interest for our demographic. If you want to hear about or learn about something specific, let me know and I'll find someone who understands us to talk about it. There's a contact page at twoboomerwomen.com. If you want to be a guest on Two Boomer Women, bring it on. There's an application form at the website, too. Finally, this show is all about conversation. We women know its value. We know how to do it, and we must perpetuate the art form. So let's get started with today's show. Agnes Knowles. It's been a long time since I didn't have a podcast interview in the can, as they say. Life happens, though. I won't bore you with the details. I considered two possibilities for this week's episode. We're approaching year-end again, a time when we tend to take stock. I think by our age, we don't bother with resolutions anymore. But there is something about starting a new year. Last year, I interviewed a woman named Louisa Hext. Louisa is the North American coordinator for the traveling photographic exhibition, The F Word, Stories of Forgiveness, a program of forgiveness project, a London, UK-based nonprofit. She's a member of the Charter for Compassion's global team and manages the restorative justice sector. Louisa serves on the Board of Conflict Resolution, Minnesota, a nonprofit organization of alternative dispute resolution professionals based primarily in Minnesota. Louisa talked with me, well, maybe I should say educated me, about forgiveness. It's a subject that's so multifaceted, and as we get older, it might be one of the things that could give us a sense of peace, of closure maybe, a sense of future. My other option is a project I'm initiating with a colleague called The Great Disenchantment. The concept came to me early one morning as I sat with a coffee as an elderly client slept. Some of you are aging with lots of piss and vinegar, lots of energy to continue the push to get recognition and respect for women. You know, that which you've been doing for the last 40 years. Many of you, us, however, are done with the fight, ready to pass that torch on. Too tired to fight, but not too tired to act. Act on your next incarnation to make this last half a positive, rewarding half. That's still true to your ideals. Now comes my butt. The plan is hatching, but it's not quite formulated enough to go public with. I need more input, and that could well be you. The greatdisenchantment.com website is just beginning, so I don't think you can contact me there. But if you go to twoboomerwomen.com, there's a contact page that you can use to jump on board or ask for more info. I appreciate as much input as I can get as this unfolds. Anyways... There's an and then to this intro. And then I received an email from Louisa Hext saying she's holding two seminars on forgiveness. Her words, Do you experience deeply entrenched feelings of resentment, anger, and regret? Are you ready to transform your life? The first webinar is tonight, really short notice. But there's another one on November 4th. So I'm going to share with you now part of my conversation with Louisa from last December. Louisa, thank you so much for being here today. Oh, it's my absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this. Louisa, I have mostly questions today. And while I've certainly thought about the act of forgiveness, I'm not sure I have enough knowledge to add much in the way of conversation. And isn't that a first? (laughs) (laughs) And please, some of this is new territory for me. So if I misuse a word, please correct me. I'm going to jump in with a question I've been unable to answer this week. Is there a single or an easy definition for forgiveness? I would imagine I'm looking and I'm thinking, and there is not. Good. Okay. I'm I'm not even here to give you a definition. I'm here to offer space for inquiry. And it sounds a little circuitous. In the sense that you ask me a question and I offer back to you, well, 
and there isn't one definition. You can look up in the Webster's Dictionary a definition or even in the Oxford Dictionary or many dictionaries. In fact, that's a question that I ask people if they have their own definition of forgiveness. And forgiveness for me, there's a lot of ambivalence there. Like, what do I mean when I talk about forgiveness? I know that it's messy. I know that it's complicated. And I know that it means many different things to many different people. So I'm not even sure I'm answering your question. At least it's a start. Well, you are, because first of all, I feel better for not being able to form a, a definition or a meaning. And I also started by saying this is the least one size fits all. So, and I think you've just answered that, like for, for every person, if I'm hearing correctly. Yeah. There is their own definition. Some people even break down the words. They talk about the for, F-O-R, and give. And so they think about it through the lens of giving. And that's an interesting perspective through my own lens. The biggest distinction for me when we talk about forgiveness is that forgiveness for me is a gift that you offer to someone else. The distinction being it's not something necessary that we can ask for. We do ask for it. However, that places the burden on the other person and oftentimes the person who's been harmed to be doing the work to make the other person feel less uncomfortable or less whatever they may feel. And so the language of forgiveness uh, can be unpacked in a multitude of ways as potentially a journey without a destination. Yet what it means to each and every one of us is entirely different. And some people don't even use that in their vocabulary. They'll use other language as they move forward on their journey, which might be restorative, redemptive, apologetic. It might be not forgiving, but it's so many different things. Okay, so we also hear about self-forgiveness. What's the difference between forgiveness and self-forgiveness? I would say that there isn't a difference per se if we think of forgiveness being the umbrella for everything that can come underneath it, one of the actions that we take is forgiveness of self. And what I've heard in my conversations with people, when I ask them to talk about self-forgiveness and I ask them to consider whether it's potentially one of the most difficult things to acquire or to ask, to get to, people, I would say 99% of the time respond almost immediately with absolutely self-forgiveness is the hardest form of forgiveness. That forgiveness of self is really, really challenging. Others say, maybe in addition to it being more or most difficult, is that one has to forgive self before one can potentially forgive anyone else. I'm not sure about that. But there's this whole story of one has to be forgiving of self because if one is not kind to oneself, how can one possibly be kind to another? I'm not saying that that has to be the case or that there's an order, but that's come up. And something that's really powerful as you talk about self-forgiveness is a quote that I'm going to share from former Archbishop Desmond Tutu, because he talks about altruism and he talks about self-interest. Altruism being we're good and gracious to the external world. We're helping others. We're kind. Self-interest, 
something more about what's happening within us. Mm-hmm. And when Marina Cantor Casino, who founded the organization, The Forgiveness Project in 2004, met with former Archbishop Desmond Tutu, with photographer Brian Moody, and I'm sure we're going to talk a little bit about this organization. He said, in response to her question, do you think this is a good idea that we should travel globally and capture stories of people who have moved from a place of vengeance, a place of revenge, a place of unforgiveness to a place of letting go, uh, restoring, releasing, forgiving, whatever it may be. Do you think it's a good idea? And this is what he said. To forgive is not just to be altruistic. It is the best form of self-interest, meaning that self-forgiveness is key. It's kind of a long-winded response, but I think it's a pretty good answer to your question. It's a great answer because it also covered off a couple of more questions I had in the lineup. So our, I think you may have answered, I don't know if you've answered this. Are, are people natural forgivers or is it an action that can be learned or arrived at? I think the important thing for me to talk about is that I'm not a researcher. I'm not an academic scientist. So I have a perspective that I believe is all powerful. And my answer to the question somebody could come back and say, well, the hypothesis says that what you just said is not true. Let me tell you my experience. I believe on my life journey with my own experience of forgiveness, also the stories that I hear of others in direct conversations, that we are hardwired for forgiveness. However, there are certain people who have the propensity to be more forgiving than others. And there are a few strategies that come into play when we think about forgiveness and those that tend to be better at it or not as good. And I learned this from Marina Cantacasino because she has a ton more experience than I do. And she's absolutely right on. It's it's a qualitative response to the question, okay? Those who are curious people tend to be better at forgiving. Those who have empathy tend to be more drawn to forgiving. One of my other favorite quotes that relate to curiosity and empathy come from one of my favorite authors, Harper Lee, from To Kill a Mockingbird. And you know the character Atticus Finch, the attorney Atticus Finch and his daughter Scout. And he says to Scout, you never really understand a person until you consider things from their point of view unless you climb inside their skin and walk around in it. It's a little bit of paraphrasing going on. Mm -hmm. If you have empathy for another person and you're curious about what led a person to behave in a certain way, I think there's a possibility that you might be more willing to recognize If they had lived their life, maybe they would have done those things. And therefore, is there a level of forgiveness there? I I also think your life's journey and your lived experience drives you in a particular direction or not. My hope for the world and the people that live in it are that we are forgiving people and that we can learn strategies and skills. Although I'm less inclined to teach forgiveness. Like if you do this, 
this, this and this, then you become a forgiving person because then it puts you inside of a box. And what happens if you don't do this, this, and this? Are you curious, Agnes? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I have a few thoughts going on in my head and, and I don't want to pursue them because they go on to other subjects. Okay. But I, I was going to ask if you need empathy for another person or their actions in order to forgive them. And it sounds like you will forgive them more easily, quickly. I'm not sure which is the correct word there than if you don't have empathy, but. It's not a requirement. Okay. Yeah. I can give a, an example, maybe a real example that could be helpful. Would that be? Yeah, no, absolutely. I have a colleague and friend in the Twin Cities, and her name is Mary Johnson. And Mary Johnson lost her one and only son, Laramian, in 1993. He was 20 years old, and he was murdered by a young man named O'Shea Israel. I say young man because O'Shea was 16 when he pulled the trigger. It was an after hours party that led to a 25 year sentence for second degree murder. And many years later, Mary visited O'Shea in prison. And since his release in 2010, they've lived as neighbors in the North side community of Minneapolis. For Mary, who was a devout Christian at the time and continues to be, she couldn't imagine, she couldn't fathom. How could she possibly forgive a person or even want anything to do with a person that could shoot and kill her son in cold blood? And so for the first seven years, she wanted very little to do with this man. She wanted him to be really locked up and the key thrown away. And as the years passed, she developed this interest and curiosity in sitting across the table from him and considering why he did what he did and considering how that might have any indication of any healing for her. So there was this curiosity and she initiated the contact. And I think for a couple of times he refused. And that is a different story. You can ask later if you want to know why he refused, which is kind of interesting. Ultimately, they sat across the table from one another and they listened to one another. He heard her story and she heard his story. And there was a bridging across the divide there, across that table. When they met, O'Shea was still incarcerated in a Minnesota prison. And there was healing. And the journey started, or at least continued at that point. She'd had a journey up until that point, entirely separated. Her experience was an experience of restorative practice, which occurs in many prison settings, in community settings, in schools. And I want to separate the language of forgiveness from restorative practice. However, what I want to offer is the fact that there was this curiosity, I believe, that could help her heal. And when she listened to his story, I believe there was a layer or layers of empathy that led her to go on that journey. And she recognized, this is not in her words, it's my words, that there was a place of moving forward. The world was moving forward. The past was in the past. It's not about forgiving the act. It's about that person taking responsibility for the action And it's not about forgetting either. It was an opportunity for her to separate those things and to be able to move forward because she was stuck. 
And people who stay in the past and can't move forward are at much greater risk of health conditions, of mental health challenges, of not living full and vibrant lives. And that was a very, very wordy response. No, no, it was great because my next question, you you told a story which leads exactly into my next question, that we hear stories of forgiveness, if not in our own lives and, you know, possibly in our communities, that can seem astounding in their generosity. Can hearing stories of forgiveness help us find a path to that action or at least consider it as an option? I think there's no, I think, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And very specifically, the stories that exist in the archive of the Forgiveness Project, a nonprofit that was founded in 2004 in London, United Kingdom by Marina Cantacuzino, demonstrate that incredibly. And this is really profound, I think, because the backdrop to the organization being born, if you step back even further, Marina was engaged in a private project. This was not supposed to be a public thing. It was not supposed to be a charity or an organization. It was supposed to be a private project gathering stories of people to be shared in the format of first person conversation and photography and actually first person narrative and photography. And the photographer, Brian Moody, traveled with Marina, who is a journalist, during the early years and gathered these stories. And there was an exhibit at the Oxo Gallery on the South Bank in London that was installed for two weeks. And she expected that people would come and view that exhibit, maybe come back again. There were catalogs. I think there were 3,000 catalogs that were sold in the space of time of that exhibit and media from around the world. And she was shocked because she thought this was an exhibit that would come and go. And there was so much interest that the organization was founded from the exhibit. So it is extremely organic as to how the forgiveness project as an organization started out of this exhibit. Just quite amazing if you think about it. Yeah. Rose, I have a dog that is making noises. I'm when sorry. I just turned around and did this, it was because my dog was making noises behind me. And I'm always glad when other people's dogs make noises. Can you so. edit that out? Or not? No, she not, not, not usually, no, because, I mean, my dog barks. She does all sorts of things. She snores. <laughs> so she's been snoring, and now she's right here. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Rose, come on. So is it necessary to have the person in front of you to forgive them? Like, like what if they're dead or something? That's okay. It's not necessary to have the person in front of you. It's not necessary for the person to be alive. When you ask that question, it makes me think about who's forgiveness really for? Is forgiveness for yourself or is forgiveness for another person? Or is forgiveness for both of you? And in reality, when I think about forgiveness for another person, I think it's releasing self and being able to move on and not being stuck and not being heavy hearted or hard hearted or closed, but having a heart open, peaceful existence. That is for me anyway, on, on my journey. However, I do notice in my conversations with people that they would like to have that person present. They would like to look them in the eyes. They would like to be listened to. And those individuals may also have the curiosity to learn about 
what led the other person to do what they did. There was a man by the name of Shad Ali, who unfortunately has passed on. Shad survived a brutal attack in London on a high street, main street, going to the defense of two women who were brown-skinned, Southeast Asian descent, who were being cornered by a man who was white, who was yelling and screaming expletives at them and harassing them. And Shad, who looked like them, went to their defense and was brutally attacked. And when he woke up in the hospital, his first interest, surrounded by his family who were fully charged and resentful, was to wonder how someone could hurt someone that much and not really care. And he wanted to have a better understanding. And it leads me back to those restorative conversations that people have, where having that person present is healing in itself. It's complex because you don't have to have the person there because ultimately it's for you. And you may not be able to, right? Because the person may be deceased. So what happens if you you have them across the table, you understand their story enough to understand why they did what they did. But if that person does not feel any remorse, take us there, please. Once again, it's not for the other person, it's for yourself. But isn't it, is it made more difficult if... I think it's more difficult. I'm thinking about it for myself because to to be truthful, I'm not an expert. I'm really someone that just holds space for people. I'm a storyteller. I'm a coach. I coordinate this incredible traveling art exhibit of arresting narratives and photographs. I'm also human, and I noticed in my body when you talked about being remorseful that there was that little, yeah, I want them to be remorseful. I want them to feel it. I want them to make apology. I want them to be accountable. I know for others and in conversations that I've had with others, those individuals are entirely comfortable saying no. Don't really care if they're alive. Don't really care if they're in front of me. Don't really care if they're remorseful or not. I'm doing this to release for myself. I'm doing this to heal myself. Because what's happening in my life isn't working and I need to do something different. And I'm ready to do something different. And the challenge is the readiness. Because in the height of the injury, in the height of the pain, in the height of the suffering, to talk about forgiveness, I think, is not appropriate. I think that there's a time and a place and a journey, as I shared earlier, without a destination, that leads people to the healing that they're choosing. And yes, you can be offered a prod here and there or an opportunity to take that space for inquiry. However, no one can make you forgive. And the way that we choose to forgive or not forgive is entirely unique. It's so incredibly complicated and layered. It's almost like the onion you know, taking off the layers of the onion and the what if and the what if and the what if. I I certainly understand that forgiveness is, first of all, for me. And Mm -hmm. as I've been preparing for our chat today and reading and doing all that stuff I was doing, I think for myself, it's the only way I could move on or even be whole again if something like if, if it was a, if there was an egregious act against me or mine 
and I can, I can see the remorse thing, but if someone shows remorse, my forgiveness of them can surely do a lot for them too, can it not? The first word that came into my mind was that you're participating in a transaction and it shouldn't really be about a transaction, yet potentially what you're suggesting is, yeah, it does do a lot if you see that person appear, present, offer remorse. They feel bad for what they've done. They're potentially accountable for what they've done and feel extremely light, light, lighthearted. I don't even know if lighthearted is the right word. But if you offer forgiveness to them, and they offer remorse to you. It's kind of circular, isn't it? Yeah, and I, I didn't. And I, I didn't mean it even as an exchange or a barter or a mm. condition of. I just mean in terms of two separate people sitting at the table. I see this transactional though. Yeah, but it's no, not I, a bad transaction. Yeah, I, but I, I think what I meant is just not to go into it with the mind of a transaction, but the, the transaction can happen. Perfect. You're absolutely right. You know, this is what's so interesting about restorative practice. I would like to talk about it because I've I've referenced a couple of stories of people who chose to have that conversation in front of one another. And the case of Mary Johnson and O'Shea and also Shad Ali and the man that harmed these women, Shad did sit across the table also in prison in England with this man. And there was healing. There was remorse in both situations. And there was the offer of forgiveness by both persons. However, practitioners in the field of restorative practice, and it's been known as restorative justice also, believe that forgiveness is not a specific outcome just because that person is accountable for their actions, which is very specifically how the conversation starts. In restorative practice, it's very important that the individual who has harmed be accountable and share their story. And they do that first. And the individual who's been harmed, oftentimes the person who's been harmed is not living anymore, yet there are so many others who have been harmed. In the case of Mary and other family members of Mary's, multiple people who have been harmed, she has the option of sharing her experience of how O'Shea's behavior caused her to feel. She has made a decision how she's going to manage her life as a result of her taking the life of her son. And she has the option of offering forgiveness or not. The the curiosity for me or the invitation that you provided to me to weigh in on was when you talked about remorse and you said, you know, if I see remorse, and this person demonstrates that they are feeling pretty bad about what they did, it makes it easier for me maybe to forgive. And also my forgiveness may release some of the shame and the suffering that the person who caused the harm feels. So that's how I thought about it as a transaction, but not as a negative thing. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. As you were speaking, what I imagine, and this gives you an insight into my leisure time, is a a, a puzzle board, like a jigsaw puzzle. And you have these pieces, you know, whether it's the people or the actions, the the injury, the remorse, the forgiveness, and, and they're all there. Now, whether they actually fit together properly, 
may or may not happen. Correct. It's not, there is not a recipe. Yeah. So th- sometimes they will fit together. And, and, and that's probably great when it does. Or I hate the word nice, but it, it, it eases perhaps mm-hmm. the situation if they fit together, but they may not fit together. And that's just a fact of life. And there's, there are practitioners that do work around forgiveness that are very specific to teaching steps and plugging in things that one does in order to forgive similar to a 12 step program or similar to Kubler-Ross's stages of grief that you have to go in a particular direction in order to reach that North star, which is forgiveness. And if you do all those things in the order, then you're going to acquire it. And I'm not of that ilk. I don't believe that you have to take particular steps. I think that there are some intrinsic ways of being that organically lead us on a path in a particular order. Like when I think about being hurt by someone's behavior and being pained by it. And then I moved to this place of being angry about it and self-righteous about it. And then with time, there's a healing. Yet there's no knowledge of what the outcome will be. There's no timeline that says in X number of minutes, hours, days, months, years, I'm going to feel a certain way. Everybody is different. And there's the whole language of not forgiving, which we haven't even touched on, that people choose not to forgive. And they're perfectly okay with that. Others don't forgive for a long period of time and then they realize it's not working for them and look for ways to heal. I just want to reassure all my listeners that Louisa does (laughs) not have my notes in front of her. Because I, I was going to ask if there was a process or a path, and you've answered <laughs> that. And I'm, <laughs> I must admit, I'm a little relieved with your answer because um, I have my own issues with Kubler Ross's process and steps. Yeah. So, and then I was going to ask that you know, like, not to give anyone an easy out, but are there people who will never get to that place where they can forgive? And you've just answered that too. So that's I appreciate that. Mm. When we spoke a few weeks ago about getting this episode together, we talked about the fact that forgiveness, and you mentioned this earlier, does not mean forgetting. Mm -hmm. Can you unpack that a little bit? And are there any other misunderstandings about forgiveness that you can think of? I think the biggest misunderstanding is that if you forgive, you forget the act. To forgive does not mean that you wipe the slate clean in your head like an etch sketch and you don't remember. You will always remember. So that's a big stereotype and a big fear that people have. Another is that you're condoning what the person did if you forgive. Like a flippancy, well, you murdered my son. Well, that's okay. I'll forgive you. Like when you step on somebody's foot by mistake and you go, which I've done, will you forgive me? I can't believe I just stood on your foot. I've done it three times now. Can't believe I did that. That's more of a figure of speech. Uh, To forgive is, as I described right in the beginning of our conversation, I believe it's a gift you give to yourself and a gift you give to someone else. And not something that you can necessarily ask for. You can, but you may not get it. Another thing that came to mind is this whole concept of radical forgiveness. And numbers of people would disagree with me when one thinks of Dylan Roof, the person who killed a number of parishioners in the church in South South Carolina in Charleston, South Carolina, in the NE Church, 
the parishioners forgave pretty automatically and it was part of their faith that they were taught that this is what you do. I wouldn't say that radical forgiveness is a stereotype. I would say that there are different ways to forgive and that you don't have to go along a prescribed path. So the the response to the question would be much about back to those steps again or back to a faith-based denomination. Or if you don't have faith, these assumptions that are made that you have to do it a certain way. And in the work that I have begun to do that I really appreciate the opportunity, providing the space for people to consider what it will take to forgive, what it will take to release pain and suffering, what their journey is, what they need to experience, rather than looking at a list of steps that say, you do this, you do this, you do this. Hmm. (laughs) This is a a huge subject, obviously, and I, I really appreciate you helping us gain some insight. And I know you've said a couple of times today that, you know, you're not an expert, but I think just your experience with the, the different pieces of the puzzle on the table are, are off. They give us good insight and give you a knowledge that many of us don't have, perhaps never will have. So as I say, I appreciate that. Is there anything else about forgiveness that we haven't discussed that is important? It's interesting you should ask that because I was thinking I have to remember to say this. There are some days that you will think that you have traveled the path and that you are close to that North Star and all of a sudden, like Fred Flintstone, You slam those brakes on and go, what on earth was I thinking? I don't forgive you anymore. There's this whole process of forgiving and unforgiving and re-forgiving and unforgiving. And it's this backwards couple steps, forwards a step, back half a step experience. The most important thing, you know, as Kabat-Zinn said, John Kabat-Zinn, wherever you go, there you are. The most important thing is to be gentle with yourself and to think intrinsically about what it is that's, that works for you because this is you. This is your vessel. This is what makes sense for you, not what makes sense for your cousin or your best friend or your professor. And the language of how we approach the subject is very important. And I'm back. Such powerful and thought-provoking ideas. If you want to listen to the entire episode, the link is in the show notes. Now, I mentioned that Louise is hosting a webinar tonight and again on November 4th. You'll learn what forgiveness is and isn't, the secrets behind forgiving yourself, The best ways to stop longing to retaliate against the person who's hurt you. The mistakes to avoid when letting go and loosening the grip of your past. You'll learn if you're wired for forgiveness. Why it's healthier to let go of grudges and resentments. And you'll hear stories of people who have transformed their lives. The link to her sign-up is in the show notes. If you have comments on today's show, please talk to us. If you're listening at twoboomerwomen.com, scroll to the bottom of the page and leave comments there. We can be found at Apple, Amazon, Spotify, Google, most places a person would listen to podcasts. Feel free to leave comments there and please leave stars and reviews. They help us grow. Before you go, hit the subscribe or follow button and you'll be notified about future interviews with more of my great guests. Share this episode with someone who might benefit. And then sign both of you up for Louise's webinar. If you want to be a guest on the podcast or know someone who would be a great guest, there's an application form at the website. Or if you want to hear wisdom on a specific subject, 
message me at twoboomerwomen.com. I actually just received such a request, so I'm now looking to learn about sarcopenia. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great rest of the week.